Hey guys, it's Miss Burton. Today we're going to be learning how to make a Zendala and we're probably going to have to break this up into a few different segments because there's a lot to this. So a Zendala is what you see here. Um, it's based on the word mandala, which is a Sanskrit word meaning circle. So when you think of a mandala, usually you're going to see something that has some amount of symmetry, meaning that you have things that um, are the same side to side or by rotation. Um, so if I rotate this, it should look basically the same. This has rotational symmetry. Okay, sometimes something has mirror symmetry where it's the same back and forth. Um, but a mandala is a circle-based design, usually intended for meditation or relaxation or focus. And you can think of a zendala as being basically that, but with tangle patterns. All right, so it's going to take us a while to get to this finished project. And you can see that compared to the tangle doodles that we have done so far, this is a lot bigger. So it's uh, there's just more work to it. All right, so let's get started. We're going to take a look at three new patterns today, and then I'll show you how to set up your Zendala, and then it's just a matter of filling in your patterns like we've done before. All right, so let's start off with one that looks like little berries or cherries. And I've seen this in books called Poke Root or Pokey Root. I'm not really sure how they pronounce it, but um, it goes something like this. So we're going to start off with a stem, kind of a shape. And it can kind of come out a little bit on the top. And then you're just going to draw kind of an oval or a circle that surrounds that. So pretty simple. Okay, And you can do another one next to it. And again, this is an organic shape based pattern. And we did one similar, quite similar, in fact, when we did this pattern here. So this one's just a single oval. Okay, and I don't want to take time to fill up this entire thing, but I could continue, make it look like this one is continuing up here. They don't all have to be exactly the same size. Um, you can make them all coming out kind of in a cluster. So if these were cherries, for example, you might see them connected at the base of the stem. So some people like to do theirs coming out together like that. And just keep in mind, that at some point they're probably going to appear to bump into one another. Okay, and so it's essentially like that. Okay, I'll do a little more. So I could choose to shade in the spaces in between if I really want to have a strong contrast or difference in value, the lightness and darkness within my pattern. It's important to remind yourself that we're not going for perfection here. The idea is the calming focus that happens when you create a pattern with repeated motions with your pen stroke, with your movement of your hand. So as always, breathing and posture are important.
Okay, you get the basic idea. I could continue. I'll come back and talk about how to shade or color this pattern later on. So the second pattern we're going to look at is this pattern here. And this one is usually called Hollybaugh. And if you analyze it, just looking at it, you're looking at kind of long rectangular sections. To me, it looks like paper strips that are kind of stacked on top of one another. There's usually a little bit of shading here. So I am going to just check my posture. If I want a basically straight line, I like to pull towards myself. So I'm gonna breathe in and then I'm gonna pull on the exhale. Okay, and generally with practice that gets pretty straight. So I'm gonna decide how wide I want this to be. Breathe in and pull the line towards me on the exhale. Okay, at this point we just wanna break up the space with alternating sections that go in different directions. So I'm gonna pull this one at a diagonal and I'm gonna pick up my pen when I touch a line. So I'm gonna breathe in, same process. Pick up my pen, continue. If it gets a little curvy, that's okay. So I'm trying for a similar spacing, breathe in and pull and pick up the pen and continue my line. Okay, now um, I often end up with kind of a star pattern here, but you can randomize this a little bit. So maybe I want this to come back here, make sure that I've waited for it to dry, breathe in. Okay, and check my spacing and continue. Okay, I got a little concern there and I picked up a little early. So we're just continuing the same basic idea. People get a little thinner as they go. If we're giving the illusion of distance, something that's further away is generally going to appear smaller. I try for approximately the same size and spacing. Okay, so just be aware of the urge to hurry. This just feels like an empty space to me that needs something. So I'm going to add, and I think I'll be done after this. All right, that's enough going on there. So you can go in here and shade in the background. What I did in my finished Zendala is I used a color and I can talk to you later about how to choose colors that work well together. Right, because that's important in creating something that looks relaxing. So I'm going to leave that for now. Um, I could shade in the background spaces with black like I did here, but like I said, I'm going to leave that for color. All right, so that's going to be that for now. And one final pattern is going to be this one. So this one was an organic shape or a set of organic shapes, really more geometric here with these straightish lines, and then back again to organic shapes. So this one I've seen referred to as onion drops. And it's going to start off with a kind of back and forth squiggly line. And I'm not going to fill in the entire space with this one. Normally would. I'm trying to do one continuous line at this point that curves back and forth in on itself. Okay, I'm going to pause and let it dry up a little bit. And at this point, I'm just going to start up kind of in the top section. If you notice, these spaces ended up kind of teardrop shaped. So I'm just going to kind of follow in and then follow in. 
Okay, and I ended up with kind of an awkward space there, and I'm just going to leave it. It's okay. I can come down and touch that bottom space, or I can leave a little gap. Either way is fine. And I'm just doing this again as a continual line. Check your posture and your breathing. And check and see if you're rushing. So I left my line at the end down there at the bottom just because it would get a little too close together in my opinion if I continued. So just a reminder that in a any kind of a tangle doodle, in this case a Zendala, when you set up your string, which is your graphite spaces, you your goal is to have your each tangle pattern fill that space as best you can. Um, but these rectangles that I draw here are just spaces for me to demonstrate a pattern. So that's a pattern by itself. Okay, and you can see that when I added color to my Zendala, I varied the colors in within that pattern. Okay, with my Halaba pattern, I stuck with one color. I stuck with a dark blue and then I used a light blue for shading. Okay, and with my poker root, I um, chose a main color for the main shape and then I shaded in the background and I have a slightly contrasting color in there. All right, so basically, those are your patterns. Um, uh, we can do a little coloring at this point. So what I used, I have a variety of different ink pens. I also have colored pencils. Thanks a lot, Siri. Didn't ask you. So I have pretty fancy colored pencils. These are colored pencils that were recommended to me back when I was in college. Um, Prismacolor, they are considered professional level colored pencils. If you can't afford these, any colored pencils will work. This is a set of 72. So I have three trays in here with different colors. One of the beauties of working with Prisma colors is they're very soft. And so the color comes off nice and smoothly onto your surface that you're working with. Okay, other than that, I have this nice set of um, brush pens. And there are 60 in here. Okay, so there's a variety of these, and these have, they're calling it a brush tip, although it's really kind of a, just a, a pointed, squishy, rubberized tip. There are some pens with actual kind of brush um, bristles that come off, and those are a little bit more unusual and often expensive. So I have a set of these. I have these really fine point ones that come in different colors. So whatever you have is fine for coloring. I've also done Zendalas that I've colored with watercolor crayon, watercolor pencil, or straight watercolor. You could do acrylic paint, you could do crayon, you could do whatever you have. So for me, when I'm choosing color, if I'm doing a project in color, a Zendala is meant to be a relaxing activity, both to do and then a finished project to look at. And I have some color wheels that I can refer to. Oh, these are the same. So if you have a color wheel, if you have access to a color wheel, you can always just do a search for a color wheel. We have colors next to each other on a circle. And we have our primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. And that just means, if you're not familiar, these are colors that cannot be made with pigments by mixing them. So we can use red, yellow, and blue to mix to get all the other colors, the in-between intermediate colors um, and tertiary colors, secondary, primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. So when you're, you want to have colors that appear relaxing, generally you're going to want to just stick to one section of your color wheel. And we call these analogous. They're next to each other. Um, you might pick just kind of three in a row. Um, oftentimes when I'm doing this with my students, I will do 
um, three in a row, but skipping the in-between colors um, when I mean three. So I really can end up with actually five. So say I wanted, I really like yellow. So if I really like yellow, I might go orange, yellow, orange, and yellow. But this, this is all really, really similar. So I might want to go yellow, orange, yellow, yellow, green. But I might want to branch out. So orange, yellow, green, and then what's in between. So just kind of stick to one side. I would say less than a half, slightly less than a half of the color wheel and you get colors that are closely related and so they don't compete with each other. There's a lower amount of contrast in what we call the hue or the base color. Now you can do lighter and darker versions of these. As I did in here, I had a really light blue in here and a darker blue here. I have a violet or a purple here and I fade out to a, a paler version of that one. And then I have a red violet here and I went as far as blue green. So if we look at mine, I kind of went blue green blue, blue violet, violet, and red violet. And I really wanted to use, um, to kind of focus on what's in here. But again, there's such a small amount of contrast here um, because we've got blue and we just really, we're just adding a little bit of red to move it towards the red and into the violet. So I went a little bit further into the blue green, which actually adds a little bit of yellow, but there's just a little bit of that and it makes the color really stand out with a bit of contrast. Okay, so we have contrast of color or hue and contrast of value in here. But um, aside from that, we wanna keep it to maybe five in a row, four in a row, three in a row on your color wheel and you'll have a nice relaxing set. All right, so to color in this one, if you wanna think of this as a, a berry on a bush or a cherry, then you have a kind of a spherical space and you're gonna get a reflection if you have a shiny skin. So I went into my markers and I pulled out some colors and I tested them. I have a paper that I'm using for testing my colors. And I wanna see how they actually show up because often we're surprised by what we get. Okay, and then when they dry out, they fade a little bit, at least with my markers. So you'll have to test what you have. I would have a test paper to test them before I put them on there. So this looks like it's a bit of a red violet that one's maybe a little more pinkish. Um, and I can go into my reds. Okay, and test them out. And of course, if we go in and layer them, they're going to interact in ways that might surprise us. So you might experiment with that and give it a minute to dry and see what happens. I think that's And the plenty that one's getting a little lighter so I think I'll put that one back so one thing I want to keep in mind here is where do I want that highlighter that reflection so I'm going to protect that area and maybe I'll go in double check how light that one is I'm just going to start with one of my kind of berry looking things and I'm going to go right underneath that line that shows where the stem comes in and then I'm just going to go just a little bit past it it would help if I zoomed in on this and so what I'm doing here is I'm protecting the highlight space and then I'm just gonna go in, this has this nice rubbery, what they call a brush tip. And so you can use the side of it and it shades in quickly. If you're using a really fine point marker, it's just gonna take you longer to shade it in. So that might be good enough for you. You might be totally happy with that and that looks great. You might decide that's too much of, that highlight is just too big, so shrink it down. Once you've cut it out, obviously you can't go back and add the highlight. Um, Usually, I'll just qualify that and say usually. So if you wanna have a darker section, it's usually a little further away from the highlight, then um, you can use a pen with a darker value, a marker with a darker value, okay? Or you could be layering colored pencils. I have to remind myself which, I've got so many of these out here, I've forgotten which one I was using. So I'm just gonna to stick to these two for now. So to repeat that, again, I'm just going right past this kind of curved black line here that's just underneath the stem section. And then I'm just gonna go in and surround or protect that highlighted section and make sure they kind of match. So you want them similar shape okay, and size. So there you've got the lightest part, you've got your mid-tone or your medium value of your color. And then I can go in to places where it's gonna be a little bit darker and just add a little darkness there. And as the ink on these dries, that's gonna change its look. So 
again, if you have a thicker marker or something with a brush tip, these can just make filling in a section so much nicer. And I was not consistent here. I have this convex where it's sticking out and here I have a concave where it's going in so that that stem has a, an indentation. So consistency is nice. That's what we're going for. Remember that perfection is just not a thing for us humans, mere mortals. So having a page to practice on will mean that once you go to do your final work, you um, will probably have a greater degree of what you consider success. Notice that that graphite line kind of just disappeared in there. So that's the basics. I'll just do one more. And so when I picked my set of analogous colors or colors that are next to each other or adjacent on the color wheel, I'm going to remind myself that I chose a little bit of blue green, blue, blue violet, violet, and red violet. And you can't see that because I zoomed out. So my colors were in here. So blue can include really pale blue. So I have some pale blue markers in here as well and I can try them out. You can see that I tried these before when I was coloring my Zendala that I made ahead of time. And so I can decide if I want to have one of these as my contrasting color for the stem. Normally when I think about if this were a real plant it would probably have a green stem or it might be a little bit brownish. Now brown is considered a neutral. If you look on a color wheel, you're generally not going to find brown on there. Um, if you go towards the center, which means that you're combining colors from across the color wheel, if you combine two complements, you have a blue. Its complement is made out of the remaining two primary colors mixed in um, balance. You get an orange out of red and yellow. So if you mix these two and they're a true blue, which doesn't have any red or yellow in it, um, and a true orange, which doesn't have any blue in it, and it's a good combination of red and yellow, about half and half, then if you mix those in balance, you should end up with kind of a gray, um, but it might have a little brown in it. Now, if they're not in perfect balance, they're going to look more brown. So brown is what's considered a neutral as you neutralize colors as you're going across the color wheel and you mix them together. Um, it's also a good strategy if you want to just get a color that's not so bright. So if I have red, and my crayon or marker or paint that I have is just super, super bright and I want it a little bit less bright, I can add just a small amount of the complementary color, which is directly across the color wheel. All right. So I'm just reminding myself that those are the colors that I'm sticking with. And you can do yourself a favor and just pull those out and set them aside so that you know that you're only working with those. So let's take a look at the second pattern that we did. Again, if you're looking for it in a book or online, it's known as Hollabaugh. I personally don't care about the names. It can just be helpful when referring to a pattern to have a name for it. So I tried out my different markers. And for some reason, I don't have a very dark blue in this set. Yeah, I do have some other fancier markers where I have a darker blue. So I think I chose this one here. And I believe that was this one that they're calling cobalt blue. And so just like I went in and shaded in the black spaces here, I'm going to go in and shade in those in-between spaces. And remember that if you use a, a darker value, so this is a darker blue, and oftentimes if I build up layers, it will appear even darker. The darker colors, the darker values, uh, often will convince our brain that that space that is colored or shaded darker is further away from us. So this can give that feeling of multi-dimensions that you're working not just on the flat surface, but that you're working um, with layers. Now I'm gonna double check what I'm filling in this section here that seems to be going behind these other ones. That's a piece of that. This little piece right here is not one of these sections. So really do yourself a favor and double check 
any section. I'm tempted to shade this one in, but nope, that's part of this piece here. Okay, because with marker, you probably know these are usually not erasable. All right, so at this point, we have a feeling, a little bit of a feeling of depth with these white sections feeling maybe like they're on top of this blue area in the background. But if we wanna add even more to that, I'm gonna use a much lighter marker. And I'm gonna think about if this is the one that's on the very top, then anything that it passes over, it's gonna cast a shadow on the side. So it passes over both of those. and that one and this one so for that section it's casting a shadow along there now i can go to each one after that and see where it would cast a shadow okay, this one would be casting a shadow down here this would be casting a shadow here. This would be casting a shadow here. Here, did I miss any? I think I got them. I might be yelling at this video right now if I forgot one or more. I'm just going to take a moment and double check, but notice now that that really adds to the feeling of depth. All right. So this last one over here, which we called onion drops, I decided personally to bring in some variations. So I kind of picked up the markers and just kind of went for it. Um, kind of section by section. Maybe I want to do the outside and I could choose to do them all the same or I could go in with a variety. The thing is, if this is the outside and this is the outside and they bump into each other, I don't want them the same color. These bump into each other a little bit, but they don't share a lot of the side. So it is something to consider. Again, this one's sharing that space. So what I might do is, is just jump over one. Just go in with something that's a totally different color and value where I'm touching that one. And that will really bring out the contrast or the difference. It will bring out the different sections and kind of highlight the beauty of the organic nature of this pattern. main thing that I'm trying to keep in mind is to not have sections do too much where they're touching and they're the same color and value. Okay, maybe I'm going to go in with a darker one. And some of these don't have a whole lot of different sections. And I can see what I have left. So since this one is so far away from the middle, if I wanted to repeat that color, I could, but I certainly could go in with something different. Okay, 
Okay, so we're still sticking to the color families that we originally chose. So this one is so far away, I'm just going to repeat it in here. I like bringing that back in. It's far away from here. And maybe I'll bring that more violet color. Okay, looks pretty good. Maybe I skipped a little section here so I can layer a little bit. That's okay. All right, so that's the general idea.